things. Uh, first, I'd like to remind you we have another talk next week uh, on Wednesday, but at 5 p.m. French time. Uh, Victor Elvira will talk about important something as a mindset. So please, if you have not done so already, uh, pen in your calendar the next week's talk. Uh, second thing, uh, in, in case this is your first time, that would be surprising, the first time you attend such a webinar, uh, your micro is uh, muted. Uh, if you want to ask a question, the best thing to do, the only thing to do actually, you go to the Q&A box. It's the rightmost icon on the bottom on your screen. You click on this, you type your question, and from time to time, uh, I will interrupt the speaker and uh, read aloud these questions, okay? So again, if you have any question, don't try to speak. Don't go to the chat, I don't uh, check it. Just go to Q&A instead, all right? Um, and then this is it. I think I've, uh, I can uh, you know, finally introduce the speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to this audience uh, John Ormeroff from uh, Sydney University in Australia. Um, John has uh, quite a few papers. I was telling us on uh, variational inference. Uh, in fact, where I was myself, where I got interested in uh, this kind of machine learning approximation techniques, uh, it was a bit hard for me to understand how it works. And what really helped me was John's papers, because John's papers uh, really managed to uh, take these different methods for machine learning and explain them very carefully and apply it carefully to different statistical models. So it's, it's really a pleasure to read these papers. I really recommend them, uh, not only those on variation and but the other, the other papers as well. But this is, uh, this is a, these are great papers, a very good introduction to, to variation and variance, or, or you should use them in, in stats. And I, it is my impression, I don't know what John feels about that, that uh, statisticians should look into these methods a bit more about what they do at the moment. Anyway, uh, this is it for my introduction. So, no, John, you, you have a floor, so to speak. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, so, today I'll be talking about Bayesian hypothesis testing. And this has been uh, one of my research interests for quite a while. Um, and it's only recently that I've started publishing directly on Bayesian hypothesis testing. Um, so, today, um, the collaborators associated with this work. Uh, Michael Stewart from the Uni University of Sydney, Wei Chang Yu, who's doing a postdoc at, uh, with Howard Bundell at the University of Melbourne, and Sarah Romanez recently finished her PhD and is at the Boston Consulting Group, earning about 25% more than me. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Bayes factors. Um, in particular, we're going to uh, touch upon paradoxes and problems associated with Bayes factors. Um, we're going to try and solve some of these paradoxes and problems using a new construction, what we call cake priors. And we'll, I'll come about what we're going to, why we've called it cake priors in just a moment. It's got a free parameter, a precision matrix, and I'll discuss which ways we can uh, specify that precision matrix. Um, and one of the nice things that comes about because of cake priors, uh, we can make Bayes, uh, tests based on Bayes factors using cake priors equivalent to likelihood ratio tests. That is, we control type one errors in a Bayesian framework, which is quite interesting in its own right. Um, lastly, we're gonna talk about some extensions. Uh, I'm gonna talk about robust Bayesian hypothesis testing. Um, and this will bring about another tool which I'm going to use to fit such models. It's called a reversed collapsed variational Bayes approximation. Um, and I'll cover another extension called multiple hypothesis testing using this, this same type of technique. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so this all came about when I was doing a postdoc with my supervisor. Uh, we we're going home together uh, to Sydney from Wollongong. We were both working at Wollongong um, and we were discussing various things. And he said to me, stay away from diffuse priors for model selection. But if you're interested, you might want to look up Bartlett's paradox, which might also be called Lindley's paradox. Um, 
And the gist of these paradoxes is that we can't have diffuse or flat priors and perform sensible Bayesian hypothesis testing. And we'll discuss why in just a moment. Um, so beset with curiosity, I set out to have or try and figure out a way of having diffuse or flat priors, that is the cake, and make sensible inferences, that is have the cake too. Okay, so how do we perform Bayesian hypothesis testing? Um, so I'm going to start off with a data vector, and that was drawn from some models, model M. So this is the data generating distribution. And we're going to consider a case where we have two competing hypotheses, H0 and H1. And these are parameterized by theta j. Um, these are two, describe two potential distributions upon which X is drawn. And we're going to perform the hypothesis test that the uh, true model is closer to M0 or the true model is closer to M1 in some sense. Um, the models could potentially have distinct parameters from two distinct models and the models may not be nested. The priors for these models we're going to note denote as P of theta j given hj. This is the prior distribution under each hypothesis. Since the parameters of each model um, could be distinct, um, there's not necessarily any overlap between the prior under the null and the alternative. Most Bayesian hypothesis tests are based on what is called a Bayes factor. Um, and this was originated um, by Good in 1952 and Jeffries in 1961 independently. And the idea behind a Bayes factor is to calculate the ratio of two marginal distributions, the marginal distribution under the null divided by the marginal distribution under the alternative. This requires uh, performing an integral over the likelihood times the prior um, for both the null and the alternative distributions. And of course, if the parameters are discrete, um, then we can re replace the integrals with combinatorial sums. Looking at Bayes factors, if you haven't seen them at all, um, they're analogous to likelihood ratio statistics. Um, so the likelihood ratio statistics, instead of integrating out the respective parameters under the null and the alternative, we maximize the likelihood under the null and the alternative and calculate that ratio. What I'm going to show is that these two statistics are quite related to one another. Um, so we're going to look at the likelihood ratio test statistic is lambda LRT of the data is equal to minus two log of the likelihood ratio statistic. Using the Bayes factor, uh, we can define what's called the posterior odds of H0 to H1. And the posterior odds is equal to the Bayes factor times the prior odds. And the prior odds is just the ratio of the prior distributions for each hypothesis. Using the posterior odds, we can calculate the posterior distribution, the, the probability, or the posterior probabilities of H0 and H1. Typically, we set P of H0 is equal to P of H1 equals half. So we can focus our attention on the base factor for our analysis. Now, to put this into a, a testing framework, uh, we've got a test function, T of X. And this is an indicator. And we're gonna define a Bayesian test statistic, lambda Bayes of the data. And this Bayesian test function is going to be equal to one if H1 is preferred and H0 
uh, zero if H zero is preferred. So the Bayesian test statistic is equal to minus two times the log of the Bayes factor. So you can see already there's um, an analogy between the Bayes factor and the likelihood ratio test statistic. Now it's well known that Bayes factors are sensitive to the choice of prior hyperparameter values. And to give it a, an example of such, Linley came up with this very simple example. So we've got normal data, Xi, and we've got one parameter, mu. It's normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared, where sigma squared is, not, uh, is known here. We want to perform a test. Uh, H0, mu is equal to a, a particular value, mu zero, and H1 is mu is not equal to mu zero. So all parameters have fixed values under H0. So there's no parameters, so you don't need any priors. Under the alternative, we need uh, a prior for mu. So the prior for mu under H1 is normal, centered around the hypothesized value, mu zero, and prior variance tau squared. Now, if we use the formula from a couple of slides ago, we can calculate the base factor. Um, and the base factor can be written in terms of a standard Z statistic. And it has this form here. Now, Lindley and Bartlett, when they looked at this base factor, they noticed two particular problems. Um, the first problem is in the limit as N goes to infinity, the base factor goes to infinity regardless of the value of the test statistic. So you could have a Z, a Z test statistic, which is highly significant, but the base factor prefers the null. Second problem in a comment by Bartlett, he noticed that as tau squared goes to infinity, then the null is always preferred. So these are, these are two problems uh, that Lindley and Bartlett more or less thought made Bayes factors problematic. Um, the third problem associated with Bayesian hypothesis testing comes about because of improper priors. Um, so consider the case where the priors under the null and the alternative are specified up to a proportional function fi of theta j. That's equal to some constant dj times fj, uh, where these fj's are improper. Using these, impro uh, these improper priors, the base factor is defined this way. Now the base factor depends here on two arbitrary constants, d0 and d1. So the problem with having an improper prior is that depending on your choice of d0 and d1, any preferred conclusion can be ch uh, chosen by the person setting the priors. And again, this was identified as early as 1935 by Jeffries. So when I first got into this, things were very confusing. Um, if you get into this literature, the, there are different papers calling these three problems by different names. Um, some people call it the lindley jeffries paradox or the bartlett jeffries paradox or the Lindley paradox or the Bartlett's paradox or the lindley bartlett's paradox. And so all of the literature is a bit confusing. So I'm going to say what each of these problems are and I'm going to attribute them a particular name and so that there's less confusion about which problem I'm talking about. Notice that you can construct different models 
under which these problems can occur both in combination and isolation. So they're three distinct problems. Okay, first one I wanna tackle is I'm going to explain away Lindley's paradox. And so from a couple of slides ago, the base factor under the simple model described by Lindley had the following base factor. And the base factor approaches infinity as n goes to infinity suggesting that the null should be preferred for very large n. If we rearrange the base factor, uh, we prefer the null when the z test statistic, z of x squared, is less than this term here. Now the problem really just occurs because we're holding x fixed while we let n diverge. If we let the x's depend on data, uh, a sequence of observations, we have to specify how this sequence of observations um, occurs. And so if xi is drawn from the null distribution, then this z of x squared will follow a chi-squared distribution and as n goes to infinity, um, any chi-squared distribution uh, distributed random variable will get dominated by this term, which behaves like log of n as n goes to infinity. So this means the null will be preferred um, when the data is drawn from the null distribution. Now suppose if the data is drawn from an alternative distribution, so the data is generated from H1, where the mean is mu1, which is not equal to mu0. In this particular case, the Z test statistic will behave like a non-central chi-squared distribution, where the non-centrality parameter will depend on N. In this case, this Z statistic will be of order N in probability. And on the right hand side, we've got a term which behaves like log of N. So because this non-central chi-squared parameter uh, distribution will then dominate the right hand side. And so the alternative hypothesis will be preferred as N goes to infinity. So this means that the Lindley's paradox is only really occurs because we're holding the data fixed rather than depending on some data di generating distribution. And this agrees with um, a paper by Robert in 19, uh, 2014. Um, in the paper, we show, show more generally that the Lindley's paradox only occurs with vanishing probability as for, for large sample sizes. Okay, so that, that was problem one, or Lindley's paradox. And now we're gonna talk about Bartlett's paradox. And we're going to use what we call cake priors to address Bartlett's paradox. So we wanna test two hypotheses. Um, and we need to specify priors. We need to specify priors in situations where we don't have any prior information. We would like these priors to be non-informative. However, due to Bartlett's paradox, if we did have non-informative priors, we wouldn't be able to do hypothesis testing. So again, we can't have our cake and eat it too. So we developed cake priors to solve this problem. Okay, so cake priors sort of look like a normal distribution. Um, so P of theta is a prior for theta, and we're gonna let this depend on a hyperparameter GI. So it's E to the minus DI on two. So this is a typical log two pi component that you'd see in a normal distribution, 
plus half log pi of theta i minus half two uh, half g i uh, one on two g i times theta i transpose. Then we've got a precision matrix pi times theta i. So here I've specified it more, more generally, where the precision matrix can be can depend on the parameter theta i. Um, I'm going to discuss different choices of this pi of theta in a moment. The key trick to cake priors is it's got two prior hyperparameters, gi, and what I'm going to do is set gi equal h to the power of one on di. Then I'm going to calculate the Bayes factor in, the, in a normal way. And this Bayes factor now depends on a prior hyperparameter H or a common parameter H. And then I'm going to let H diverge. Now, I've, what I'm essentially doing is I'm letting these GI hyperparameters diverge, but I'm letting them diverge in such a way that they depend on the dimension of the null and alternative distributions. The rate at which these GIs diverge is really important so that the base factor behaves well. So I'm going to show you how things can behave poorly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let G0 equals G1 so they're the same under the null and the alternative hypotheses. If I use these priors and try and calculate the base factor, then the base factor is equal to g to the power of d1 minus d0 on 2 times this, this component. Now, as g goes to infinity, these components in the exponents go to 0. But this part here doesn't, and so that the base factor goes to zero as g goes to infinity. So the prior variance dominates the base factor, and we end up selecting the, the, the model which has the smallest complexity as g goes to infinity. Now, if we use gi, is equal to h to the power of 1 on di. When we come to calculate the base factor, using properties of logarithms, we get the cancellation of this term that depends on h. Now, if we let h, go to, we let h diverge, we get this expression here for the base factor in such a way that the prior variance doesn't dominate the base factor. It's a simple trick, but it's a nice, neat construction. All we need to do now is specify how we choose the prior precision matrix PI. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a Laplace approximation. And in general, the marginal distribution of X for each hypothesis has this general form. So we've got um, half log of pi, this is the this part comes from the precision matrix. We've got a minus half log of the observed information matrix evaluated at theta, the maximum likelihood estimator, minus half the BIC for hypothesis I, plus terms that go to zero plus common constants that cancel when calculating the base factor. So here, BIC is the normal BIC that you'd see when for calculating the Bayesian information criteria. We're going to specify three different possibilities for choosing this PI now. And each of these choices of the prior precision matrix has advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so the first choice we're going to try, um, perhaps the most naive, would be let this PI 
equal to an, uh, some identity matrix of dimension di. Um, in this case, the marginal distribution for each hypothesis has this form. We've got this minus log determinant of the observed information matrix. And we've got minus half BIC that again, and these terms here. So the advantage of this is that the cake prior is a proper prior that is that it integrates to one and it's independent of any data. However, it's got some major drawbacks. If we look at the term log of the observed information matrix evaluated at the maximum likelihood estimator, this term appears in the field of optimal design. Uh, where it plays the role of measuring the overall stand size of the standard errors under the hypothesis. This marginal distribution for each hypothesis implies that if you're comparing two hypotheses with equal BICs, the base factor will prefer the model with the larger standard errors. Um, this is not desirable. So if you have two models which basically give the same fit according to the BIC, when we set PI equal to the identity matrix, we tend to prefer the hypothesis with the larger standard errors. So this isn't a particularly good choice. We've also got to calculate this log determinant term for each model under consideration. Um, it's not parameterization invariant. So this is not a good choice. Second choice that we might consider is the prior precision matrix is equal to the Fisher information matrix. In that case, we've got this expression for the marginal distribution of X given HI. This is a little bit more complicated. Here, J tilde is a bias corrected observed information matrix. Uh, the advantages are that these log determinant terms sometimes cancel. Now, in this expression, we've got a new term, theta hat BC. And theta hat BC is a second order bias corrected maximum likelihood estimator. Um, so it's got error of order n to the minus one instead of n to the minus half. So it's a more accurate maximum likelihood estimator. Um, models with larger standard errors are implicitly penalized. And as H goes to infinity, the prior approaches uh, the determinant of the Fisher information matrix to the power of half. And this is a Jeffries prior, which is parameterization invariant. The disadvantage of this choice is that the prior under HI might, might not integrate to one. Lastly, um, if we set the value of theta in the observed information matrix, um, then we get this nice simplification the log of the marginal distribution of X for each hypothesis is equal to minus half the BIC for HI plus uh, an error term, which goes to zero, uh, plus a, con uh, a common constant. So this is a, gives us a proper prior and it's approximately parameterization invariant. However, it does not penalize large standard errors and doesn't protect against irregular likelihoods. Um, and it doesn't have nice higher order asymptotic properties. Okay, so next problem we're going to try and get to is the arbitrary constants problem. So as in the limit as H goes to infinity, cake priors become improper. So the arbitrary constant problem becomes relevant. And to show how this occurs, instead of letting this prior hyperparameter g equal gj equal hj to the power of one on dj, we're going to let gj equals dj times h to the power of one on dj. 
so we're going to let the GJs diverge, but we're going to allow for some wiggle room about how these GJ terms diverge. If we go and um, calculate the Bayesian test statistic, lambda Bayes, we get a similar type of thing occurring as we saw before. So lambda Bayes is equal to the likelihood ratio test statistic minus uh, degrees of freedom, so the difference between the two DJs times log n, plus this arbitrary constant delta, plus terms which go to zero. So the parameter posterior distributions will be the same for all choices of delta as h goes to infinity. So in our attempt to construct a cake prior, to avoid Bartlett's paradox, we still haven't avoided the arbitrary constant problem. So problem three is still a problem. Um, so this means we need to specify some additional constraints in order to specify this new constant delta. Um, I have two such, two such suggestions. Um, the first suggestion I'm going to use uh, a quote from a personal essay on base factor, factors by Daniel Navarro in 2018. And in that essay, she states this. It turns out that O1 terms can be very large in practice and you can get all sorts, this is talking about base factors, and you can get all sorts of absurd results. For example, a nested model that's judged to be more complex than a full one with small, say, near a thousand or so observation samples. So the O1 terms in Bayes factors uh, can be highly problematic. Um, so we're going to introduce a constraint, and the constraint is that any O1 terms, if we want them to not be large, we can set them equal to zero. And in a cake prior setting, this is equivalent to setting delta is equal to zero. And in doing so, we've removed all order one terms tra trailing the BIC. However, the freedom given by being able to choose delta gives us another possibility. If we let delta equals new log n minus uh, chi squared two nu alpha, where chi squared nu two alpha, uh, nu alpha is the upper tau quant quantile function of the chi distribution with new degrees of freedom. This means we can be Bayesian and control the asymptotic type one error. And we can have procedures that are nearly identical under both Bayesian and maximum likelihood paradigms. And we can choose the interpretation of our results either from the Bayesian or frequentist paradigm. So if you've got anyone, if you're a Bayesian and you've got any frequentist friends, well, uh, you don't have to fight about whether you're a Bayesian or a frequentist anymore, because using this construction, we've got uh, a procedure which is identical under each paradigm. Um, let's have a quick look at the asymptotic theory before looking at some applications. Um, I'm only going to brush over this since I, I noticed that it's 7.39 in Australia time. We can determine properties of the Bayesian tests you, by looking at the asymptotic properties of the likelihood test statistic under the alternative distribution and the null distribution. Under the alternative distribution, the likelihood ratio test statistic is of order n. And so if the likelihood ratio test statistic is of size n, then it's gonna dominate the new log n if the, alt, if the alternative true, is true. If the null is true, then the new log n 
will be do dominated, will dominate the likelihood ratio, ratio test statistic. And what this means in terms of hypothesis testing theory is that Bayesian tests using cake priors are what are called Chernoff consistent. That is the type one error goes to zero and the type two error goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, so let's look at some extensions. Um, as way of motivation, I'm part of the Sydney Bioinformatics Group, a precision bioinformatics group at the University of Sydney. And one of the, our main cancers that we look at is the survival times of stage three melanoma patients. And what they found is that there's two main groups of stage three melanoma patients. Patients that have a poor prognosis. These are patients that have survival times less than one year. And good prognosis group, which has survival times greater than four years. And there's five or 10% of people that are between one and four years. And what we want to do here is to see if there's differences in the gene expression levels of their tumors between poor and good prognosis groups. So we're going to do a hypothesis test. Um, and typically we might do this using a two sample t-test. Um, so here what we're looking for is what is typically called dif differential expression, where the mean in the expression level for a particular gene is different between two conditions, that is poor prognosis and good prognosis groups. So in the order to try and find potential bioinformatic, uh, bio, biomarkers for the various phenotypes. These days, a lot of people have already done differential expression. So they're looking at it a little bit deeper to try and find, are there any other uh, properties of the gene expression levels which could be used to find different biomarkers? Um, so what are people looking at these days, at least some people are looking at differential distribution, um, where there are differences in the distribution, not just the mean, of expression levels between two classes. So we've, under the null, we've got a normal distribution and under the alternative, we've got two means and two variances. So when we looked at this, we wanted to look at, try and find different genes which had differential variability. The likelihood ratio test statistic for this hypothesis is this. What we found is that was that this test is extremely fragile, even to a single outlier, this, which meant that we couldn't control type one error. Um, to give you some sort of indication for the data set that we were given, these are the three, uh, six top genes. Um, if you do a naive likelihood ratio test to check, uh, test for differential variability or differential distribution. And what we noticed is that these top hits were driven by outliers. Um, so we wanted to try and improve upon this um, by developing a robust version of this test. So the other problem was that the oncologists that we were working with wanted p-values and I was a Bayesian. So I wanted to develop a Bayesian test, which is both robust to outliers and controls for type one error. So here I considered the model, um, this model here, and to break this down, each observation will depend, uh, will get assigned to different clusters depending on the values of Y and Z. This ZI is an indicator that, uh, that the I sample is an outlier. Um, so if ZI is equal to zero, it gets assigned to this normal distribution. If it's not an outlier, then it gets into this part of the formula. And depending on whether the null is true or the alternative true is true, we've got one normal distribution or two normal distributions, um, depending on whether H0 is true or H1 is true. Um, 
So here YI is the survival indicator, XI is a gene expression level. Um, and we've got these model parameters. So we're going to use cake priors to fit this model. Um, and the cake priors for this model, for the means, we've got a normal distribution. For the alternative, uh, for, for the variances, we've got log normal distributions. We're also going to put, so ZI are indicators of whether a particular observation is a, um, an outlier or not. So we're going to give those a Bernoulli distribution and rho is going to be a uniform. Um, so the priors that I've described so far are multivariate um, in partial answer. I'll come back to that question if I have time later. All right, so if we perform uh, the base factor here can be written as a mixture of likelihood ratio test statistics. So here we need to perform a combinatorial sum over all outlier configuration Z. So the base factor can be written in this particular form. It's a sum over all combination Z of minus half a likelihood ratio test statistic, which depends on the configuration Z, plus half this term here, which is a cutoff to control type one error times the prior over the combinations of Z. To fit this model, we use the reversed collapsed variational base to fit the model, a base mo uh, algorithm to fit the model. So, John, yes? Sorry for the interruption, but we have a question which might be relevant to this part. Can I ask it now? Yep. So it's a question from Isar Toren. Uh, beyond the powerful properties you have described here, how flexible archaic priors in actually describing prior knowledge? And is there a multivariate version? Oh, uh, cake priors, the construction is a multivariate version. How are the so they're constructed to, uh, for situations where we don't have prior knowledge? If we had prior knowledge, if we could uh, well describe um, our prior knowledge using a distribution, you should use that. So cake priors are mainly for situations where we don't have pro uh, good prior knowledge for a particular parameter. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I guess so. Thank you. You can proceed. So I... Um, if you're not familiar with variational bays, the idea behind variational bays is to transform an integration problem into a maximization problem. Um, this is usually used using a construction using the callback. So you can show that the log of the marginal distribution um, has this particular form, which has two components. Uh, the integral of Q of theta, parameterized by xi times log of p of y, and the joint distribution of y and theta divided by this q distribution for theta, plus the kullback leibler distance between q of theta and the posterior distribution for theta. Since the kullback leibler distance is strictly positive, um, this, if we drop this term, we've got a lower bound for the log marginal likelihood, where we've got parameters to spend that depend on, that this lower bound depends on xi. In order to make this bound as tight as possible, we maximize the right-hand side with respect to xi to make the approximation as accurate as possible. Um, and we need to, if we carefully choose this, these Q distributions of theta, um, the lower bound becomes computationally tractable. Um, there are different ways of choosing these Q distributions, but the most common one is to use this mean field variational Bayes type idea uh, by factorizing this Q distribution into a set, a product of uh, distributions over subsets of parameters. And it can be shown that the optimal value, the optimal way that 
use these QI distributions is to satisfy this, this formula. If we update these QIs iteratively, where we can show that each update increases the lower bound on the log marginal likelihood, and upon convergence, these optimal QI stars are a local maximizer of the lower bound. Uh, this is typically called variational Bayes or BB for short. Uh, we're going to use, uh, I hope most people have seen that type of idea before. Uh, we're going to use a variant of this now. Uh, we've called this reverse collapsed variational Bayes. Um, so this is a variant of collapsed variational Bayes, which was developed by Ta Ta in 2007. And it's also related to the marginal variational Bayes of Ying in 2008, which are two methods for improving variational Bayes. Okay, so variation, reversed collapsed variational Bayes is similar to CVB, except where the CV, the VB and integration steps are in the reversed order. So how this works, if theta one and theta two are a partition of the parameter vector theta, reverse collapse variational Bayes seeks out to integrate either theta one or theta two analytically. First, we calculate a lower bound on the distribution of y and theta using Jensen's inequality. And in the second step, we can integrate out theta one. If we've got more than, if we've got three sets of parameters and we're integrating out theta one analytically, then we can iterate between uh, VB-like steps for Q of theta two and Q of theta three. We use VB type arguments to integrate out theta three from Q of theta two and theta two from Q of theta three. And then integrate one out, theta one out analytically. And we can iterate between these two steps and then calculate another lower bound. So this is very similar to variational Bayes, except because we integrate out subsets of parameters analytically, we don't need to perform the updates for those parameters. Um, so this means our variational Bayes algorithms are both faster and more accurate. So to show you why this robust hypothesis testing works, uh, we perform some simulations. This is a simulation where we're gonna simulate from the null hypothesis and take a single observation and perturb it towards infinity. The black line represents the probability of rejecting the null for the likelihood ratio test and the robust Bayesian test that we've developed controls for type one error. Um, I'll come back to that question a little later. Um, when we apply it to our simulations, it uh, detects the outliers uh, quite well. Um, and if we look at the p-value histograms for different types of tests, the likelihood ratio test, the t-test, and the Kolomogov-Smirnov test, um, even if we remove, uh, if we take a single observation and perturb it to a plus or minus infinity, um, the distribution of these p-values should be uniform under the null. Um, our Bayesian, robust Bayesian test um, does actually look, uh, the p-values from our robust Bayesian test are almost uniform. So we've, we've done a great job at uh, removing the outliers. Um, and we select sensible genes when we look at our melanoma data. Uh, we select, start looking at sensible genes where the distribution of the gene expression levels uh, isn't driven by particular outliers. I think I've almost run out of time. Um, How much more time do you need? Yeah. 
Bayesian hypothesis testing. This is based multiple Bayesian hypothesis testing, which has worked with Wei Chang. It's a simple, similar idea. Um, we've got, uh, we look at mixtures of distributions under null and the alternative. We've got model selection indicators, gamma, gamma J, which indicate whether the null or the alternative is a better fit to the particular data set. Um, and this has really nice properties. Um, in fact, we showed using this type of approach that the Briar score um, approach at zero as n goes to infinity, provided the number of tests p is of order e to the power of n on log n. So the number of tests that can be performed uh, can grow nearly exponentially. Um, and the rates of convergence are asymptotically equivalent to two-step two procedures in these biometric papers. Um, and I think I, I, I might leave it there since I've run out of time and I don't want to impose my time on anyone else. Thank you all. Thank you, John, for your talk. Um, we already have uh, one question the, from Sergio Garrido. I think he asked it uh, a few minutes ago where you were talking about the mean field assumption. He says, would it be possible or would it make sense to have a full rank variational distribution instead of a mean field assumption? Um, you certainly could. There's no reason why it's not possible. Um, yeah, there's, I think that's an answer to the question. Yes, I would make. I mean, can you do variational inference with uh, full rank? I'm not sure what uh, when Sergio meant by full rank actually, but. Uh... Um, so one of the other approaches is to um, specify the Q distribution as a, a multivariate normal distribution or a oh, I see. I see. multivariate skew normal distribution or a multivariate copula distribution um, to try and capture the shape of the posterior distribution a bit more accurately than this mead field assumption. Um, so there the covariance matrix for the Q distribution um, could be could be full rank. Uh, there are also low rank approximations of the prior, so the Q distribution um, covariance matrix. Uh, does that answer your question? I think it, it answers mine, but I hope Sergio is also happy with you. Sergio, you can, if you, have, you want to ask something more, you can type again in the Q&A box. Uh, we have another question from Alvaro Uzaeta. Could you explain a bit the intuition behind introducing BIC in the cake prior specification? Could it be oh. possible to use WAIC instead? Oh, uh, I didn't introduce the BIC. The BIC comes about naturally because of the cake prior specification. So if you calculate uh, the integrals associated with the base factor, the, B, the BIC comes about naturally. Um, would it be possible to use the WAIC instead? Um, it would be possible, but I don't know exactly how because I haven't thought about it. Uh, the, you have to try and construct that gives you a base factor which incorporates the WAIC. I'm not sure exactly how you do it, um, but it's certainly within the realms of possibility. Huh. Um, I have one question myself. Yes. Uh, when you do uh, mixture modeling, uh, you also have a problem of outlier sensitivity and one way to address the problem is to add an extra cluster to capture the outliers. For instance, you could take a mixture of Gaussian and have an extra uh, cluster which consists of a uniform distribution of uh, 
a wide range. Yes. Is it not uh, related somewhat to what you were trying to do uh, when you tried to introduce these new components for uh, outliers? That's exactly what I was. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Um, so when looking at trying to get robust Bayesian hypothesis testing, I considered you know a Laplace approx a La Laplace model or a student T model, and that they had problems. Um, so if I was using a Laplace model, it would be robust to the mean, but not robust to the variance. So that would cause problems. And the student T distribution is only robust if you hold the degrees of freedom parameter fixed, which leaves the problem of choosing the degrees of freedom parameter. Um, so that's the reason I've cho chosen mixtures. So the mixture component here, um, is, is chosen so that it picks up gross outliers. I find it interesting because they, there is this recent paper by Christian Robert and colleagues where they try to uh, cast the hypothesis testing problem as a mixture model problem. I don't know if you're familiar with it and if there would be any way to use uh, your ideas instead in, for mixture models. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with it, but there are literally thousands of papers on Bayesian, uh, on Bayesian hypothesis testing, so it's sure. not <laughs> the <best> one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and uh, sorry, maybe one last question for me. Um, there's a, you... there's a couple on the, the board. Oh, um, today. sorry, let me ask who's first. Uh, from Pietro, I was accustomed to think that the paradox arises from the different scale of the null and alternative priors, particularly when the null hypothesis is a point null. For instance, yep. when the parameters characterizing the alternative don't exist in the null. Do CAC priors work it's also when compared to point null hypothesis in terms of yes. Okay. Error? All right. Um, so I. I I've uh, hidden some detail, and one of the problems occurs when the null hypothesis has zero parameters. Um, and we've got a particular construct in the paper involving some imaginary data, um, which gets around that problem. Uh, so the point null, the, the, yeah, the point null hypothesis tests. Um, we do get it around, but um, there wasn't enough time to talk about it here. And we have uh, two more questions. One from, uh, I don't know to say that name, sorry, in advance, uh, Javier, maybe, Javier Rubio. Have you compared the performance of cake priors with that of non-local priors? Um, I'm unfamiliar with non-local priors. So uh, the answer is no. <laughs> that's, that's a quick, quick answer. Uh, then from Emanuele, one issue of variation base is underestimation of posterior uncertainty, which might yep. not be a concern in some settings, for instance, prediction. But this aspect is crucial in hypothesis testing. Is your method somewhat affected by this issue? Uh, all right, so that's one of the reasons we use very uh, we used collapsed variational bays or reverse collapsed variational bays. We integrate out the uh, model parameters analytically. So this removes a lot of the variance underestimated with these methods. Um, the only parameters we don't are the model selection indicators. Um, and we showed we developed some theory to show that the model selection indicators, approach their true values um, so they're consistent in some sense as the number of samples goes to infinity. Uh, so in these settings, uh, using this collapse variational Bayes type ID, the variance under estimation is not a problem. Um, that's a real, that's a topic that I'm pursuing right now. I've developed a correction for variational Bayes um, and that should come out in the, the next six months or so. Um, I figured a way of correcting 
variance under estimation for variational base. Okay, so no more questions from the Q&A box. I just wanted to ask maybe you talk mostly about Gaussian priors. If I have parameters that uh, are constrained somehow, you would recommend uh, to reparameterize the models to, to always use yeah. a Gaussian prior? And, that, and that's what I've done here. So um, let me go back a few slides. Uh, so here, when we use K priors for the variance components, um, we uh, took exponentials, created the cake priors, and then took logs to get this log normal distribution for the cake prior. So yeah, if there are constraints on the particular parameters, you need to perform some transformation so that they're on the whole rail line. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, any more questions from the audience? David, maybe? Yeah, I can ask a question. I'm, I'm trying to visualize how this works, actually. And um, like I'm imagining it as like, like a composite model with like, like you could put, say, a prior of half on, on the fact. I think that's the thing of your very first example. We have one dimension, and one of the models has no parameters. So, and so yeah. maybe like you have a delta function as a prior on this one, and then something diffuse on the other. And then you. Okay have a likelihood function that I, and I also think the thing that you're doing that's maybe I'm not used to thinking about is you're thinking about how the likelihood function changes as you increase the, the sample. Uh, yeah. So looking at uh, how, yeah, how the prior variance affects the, the Bayes factor. So you need to be a bit careful, um, otherwise the Bayes factor blows up. So yeah, tail must have been like potentially hitting the hitting the, the delta bit plus or, or the, like the the two bits. One one bit is the tail is touching the delta, and that's you know h zero, I suppose. And then there's the integral under this the the. And I'm trying to think how this changes as how's the likelihood function change as you increase the amount of data. And I guess it becomes narrower, and the peak goes down, and somehow you're getting these strange properties because of these, these behaviors or um, tell me if I'm wandering around in the dark. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that I'm catching your drift. Okay, maybe, maybe, it's, a, maybe it's too difficult to do like this. <laughs> um, it's a little, with a whiteboard, it'll be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Someone needs to invent a whiteboard anyway. <laughs> um. All right, I guess we are done with question. Let's thank again, John, for a great talk. And uh, see you next week for our next talk by uh, Victor Elvira. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you very much. You, you've been very kind. <laughs> <laughs> and we only were, I, I, I clap in. Some people are typing. Uh, yeah. Thanks in the box. Thanks, everyone, for listening. It's a bit strange. Coming from Sydney, you don't know exactly what an impact your work is having. <laughs> it's good that you all turned up. Thank you there very much. There are always more people reading your paper that you realize. That's uh, <laughs> what I tell to my students. Anyway, thanks again. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye. <laughs>